themselves, like One, Two, Three and The Fortune Cookie. But the problem with some of the movies after the early 60s is that he was no longer ahead of the curve. Uh, he was now uh, trying to catch up, and, and audiences were ahead of him. And that led to eventually his unfortunate final film, Buddy Buddy, where he, it, it just fails. It's just like the, the audience is so far beyond where he is. It's, it's unfortunate that you know, he didn't, didn't get to make a better final film, but that we have what we have. However, Some Like It Hot represents Billy Wilder at the very top of his game. Some would say The Apartment, some might have other favorites, but this is one of his best. And this is a movie about sexual and gender identity that was years ahead of its time. One can see why the Legion of Decency and other groups was up in arms about this film with its casual attitudes towards sex, its look at power relationships between men and women, and a performance by Monroe that was unbelievably hard to get, but maybe the pinnacle of her career. Now, there were many stories uh, about how difficult she was to work with on the film. Uh, they wanted, she, she was re the reason the film got made, because they needed a big star, and she was the big star, and that allowed him to cast Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon, who were rising stars, but they were not of her caliber at that point in their careers. They wanted to make her feel welcome. She had worked with Wilder on Seven Year Itch, and they said, we're gonna throw a big party to welcome her to the production. Uh, cocktails, I think, were at 6, and dinner was at 7.30, and she and her husband, Arthur Miller, the playwright, showed up after 10 o'clock. This was very typical for Monroe all through this film. You heard, Matt stole my story about, uh, uh, about where's the bourbon, but he, he saved the punchline for me. The second day, as they're doing take after take, now second day of where's the bourbon, at one point Wilder says, it's okay, we'll get it. And she looked at him and goes, get what? <laughs> she ha had no clue that she was being the problem here. Now, I, I want to be fair to Monroe because there were some things that she did brilliantly here. Um, the scene where she meets Shell Oil Jr. on the beach, they, they were dreading shooting that scene. It was an outdoor scene. There were so many things that can go wrong. She got it in one take. Uh, Wilder was also open to suggestions from actors, and she um, pushed to have the film done in color. She was not; she had done black and white early in her career. She felt she looked better in color. I wouldn't argue with that, but he showed her the tests of Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis in their heavy makeup, and for the film and lighting at the time, they looked like the Frankenstein monster. And they were, they were green, it was terrible. And she said, wait, we have to shoot this in black and white. But she also said to him, I don't have an entrance. I just like walk into the film, I'm the star, I need an entrance. And he said, you know, you're right. And so that scene when she's coming down the train platform and the, the, the steam shoots out of the train and she gives that little jump and wiggle, that was her entrance. That was added at her behest. And he said she was right. She, she's the star. She needs a moment to come into the film. And it also has Jack Lemmon's you know, great response. It's like, it's like Jello on Springs. <laughs> it's a whole different sex. <laughs> Wilder was exasperated. And after this film, he said he spoke to his psychiatrist and his accountant, and they both said he's too rich and he's too old to go through that again. And, and there was some exchange of words between him and, and Arthur Miller. Uh, but in the, in the end, uh, Wilder had to acknowledge that there was something, she had a special quality. And I, I love this quote. He goes, now my Aunt Minnie would always be punctual and never hold up production. But who would pay to see my Aunt Minnie? <laughs> this, this is a movie where, as I said, Joe and Jerry become better men be, by becoming women, with the most macho character wearing spats, and when gay marriage in 1959 is embraced with the line, nobody's perfect. Now, several Wilder films have memorable lines, because you know, he started with the script, it was about the words. So Sunset Boulevard is chock full of famous lines, including the, you know, the, the line at the end, all right, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. 
And as you'll see tomorrow in the apartment, and I'm not even going to tell you what the line means, you're going to just have to watch the movie, shut up and deal. Uh, and there's, then there's a line from the major and the minor that may have been Wilder, it may have been Robert Benchley who delivered the line, but it's a great line. He says to Ginger Rogers coming out of the pouring rain, why don't you get out of that wet coat and into a dry martini? <laughs> but perhaps the most famous single line from any Wilder film is, well, nobody's perfect. Uh, and interestingly, over the years, and Wilder was interviewed many times, uh, he would be asked, so who came up with this idea, and who came up with that idea, and, you know, and he, he would not take credit for himself. It was always, we did it together, it's our script. It was, it was always, as a, as a matter of fact, um, when uh, he and Diamond won the Oscar for screenplay for the apartment, their thank you speeches were very brief. Thank you, Mr. Wilder. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. That was how he felt about his, his screenwriting collaborators. Yet, always, Wilder insisted that credit had to be given for Nobody's Perfect, and he insisted the credit go to Diamond. It was a Friday afternoon. They weren't sure uh, what, end, what the end of the film was going to be, and Diamond came up with, well, Nobody's Perfect. And Wilder wasn't convinced. And he said, but look, all right, it's Friday afternoon, we got the weekend to think about it, maybe we'll come up with something better by Monday. Well, by Monday, neither of them had a better solution, and so they went with it. And when they had the first test screening of the film, remember now, AFI says it's the funniest comedy ever made. The way they would do these test screenings in, in Hollywood is there would be some theater, say on a Saturday night, uh, here's our, our main attraction. Stick around for a, a free sneak preview of an upcoming film. And when the house lights came up after the first screening of Some Like It Hot, nobody laughed. The film died. One person laughed. And it was the television personality, Steve Allen, who came up the aisle and saw Wilder and said, this is a great film. They figured out what went wrong. The studio, somebody, brilliantly added this as a double feature to Tennessee Williams' potboiler about homosexuality and cannibalism suddenly last summer. It has to be the worst double feature in history. Uh, when they tested it again with a more appropriate film, audiences roared. When they were primed for a comedy, they got it. Now, sometime later, Wilder would be asked in interviews, of all your movies, you made so many great movies, what's your favorite? And he mentioned Some Like It Hot as one of his favorite films. And the interviewers were often surprised. Really? Some Like It Hot? Not, not one of your more serious films like Double Indemnity or The Lost Weekend? And his answer was, well, they're nice films, but I didn't have a piece of the gross. Now, this week, uh, you, you, you're having a chance to see four of Billy Wilder's very best films. And I've taught them all. And when I did a class that focused in part of his career, I included them all. He was a very special talent who moved easily between comedy and drama, bringing serious moments to comedies like Some Like It Hot in the Apartment, and comic moments to serious films like Double Indemnity and Sunset Boulevard. So before, I, I know we're going to have time for questions, but I want to close my formal remarks on a personal note. My daughter is 21, and when she was much younger, I could influence her tastes by introducing her to various movies. And I, especially when she was a little kid, I would show her slapstick comedies by Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton, uh, along with many other films. And as an adult and, and the daughter of a critic, you, you could, even though she wants to be a high school biology teacher, uh, she, you can imagine she has her own very strong opinions. She's, she's my daughter. Uh, what I, I love the fact that she still loves Keaton and Chaplin, but when she, and, and she introduces them to her friends and, some, and gets very forceful about it. Uh, but her favorite movie, and I had no... Uh, no reason to push this as the film that she should, uh, she should make her favorite, is Some Like It Hot. And whenever she starts dating somebody new, a turning point in the relationship is when she gets him to watch Some Like It Hot. 
If he likes it, he may be promoted to boyfriend. If he doesn't, he's history. <laughs> I would like to believe that somehow Wilder knows his films have endured. Thank you. Uh, all right, there's the person with the microphone. Thank you. Mr. Kimmel has agreed to sign copies of his book, I'll Have What She's Having, behind the scenes of the great romantic comedies directly following the lecture outside of Phillips Auditorium. We now have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. Was it Marilyn Monroe singing in the uh, movie yes, we just... Yes, she sang in other films. She was in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and there's no business like show business. Um, yes, that, that, that was definitely her, her singing, and I, I love her performances in this, especially that, that last song, which, which is really poignant. Uh, yeah, she could, she could sing. Uh, our table's wondering how Ori Kelly's gowns on Marilyn Monroe passed the code. <laughs> okay, okay the, the, the question is, Ori Kelly was the designer for this film, and some of those outfits, yeah, that's like right up against the production code. That was the reason that the, uh, some of the, um, the, the groups that were, you know, like the Legion of Decency that were concerned about morality in the movies found, that was one of the elements they found shocking. I mean, some of those outfits looked like they were painted on. Um, and and I, I understand there would sometimes be problems in the projection booth where pieces of film would disappear after it played at a particular <laughs> theater. Uh, there, is, there is a story, I'm going to have to clean this up because this is a, a family audience here. Uh, but uh, she, Marilyn Monroe comes to the set one day, she's looking at the outfits that have been designed for Lemon and Curtis, and she decides that um, uh, she wants one of them for herself. Now she, I think she had um, a production credit on the film. She had more clout than Curtis or Lemon on the film, and if she wanted that outfit, she was gonna wear that outfit. And Ori Kelly couldn't resist giving her a little dig. And, he, and again, like I said, I'm cleaning this up a little bit. Uh, Ori Kelly says to her, says, you know, uh, Tony has a nicer tush than you do. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, well, he doesn't have these. And she opened up her blouse. <laughs> and he had to admit, no, he didn't. Thank you for a very engaging and, and, and informative um, uh, lecture today. Um, I was thinking of another one that considered one of the best comedies ever made, and Tootsie, the same thing. But instead of trying to evade being murdered by the mob, he's just trying to make a living as an actor, and he can't do it. He's, he's considered he's too difficult to work with, but therefore he does it, and becomes, he emits, becomes a better man yes. because of doing that. I was, the parallels from that and Tootsie. To Tootsie, Tootsie yeah. is clearly a descendant of Some Like It Hot. I haven't, I, I haven't seen it in a number of years, but yes, I, when, I, when I was writing this and I got this, you know, became a better man by being a woman, I remembered Hoffman having that line in Tootsie. Uh, yeah, but I wonder if Tootsie would have been made but for Some Like It Hot. Like I said, you know, and, and worth noting is that the and I'm not up on the technical stuff, the lighting, the lenses, the film, the, all the technology of filming had so advanced from 1958 to Tootsie, I think is 81, 82, 83, somewhere around there, that they could shoot it in color. And, and, and Hoffman did not look grotesque at, when he was dressed up in his female persona. Uh, we had the reference to Marilyn Monroe's outfit, but it seemed like there were so many other references in the film, um, you know, in the cross-dressing and the um, sexual ambiguities and some of the situations that almost seemed like Billy Wilder and his collaborator were trying to see exactly what the limit was, the Producers Guild, to... Uh, allowed them to make the film. Was this more 
um, poking fun at it also? Well, one, yeah, one thing you should understand is, and, and this was brought out, I think, by one of the other speakers, at this point, Wilder is now basically with the, the Mirish Brothers. They're an independent production company that are releasing through United Artists. And so they had more freedom than he had at Paramount when he was, you know, he was under studio rule. They still had to obey the production code, and so there were limits to just how far he could go. But he, he, I think he had a much more creative leeway uh, when he was working with Mirish than when he was working under the studio system. You know, he had he had more control over it, and and clearly they're they're playing with all sorts of things. I mean, you know, the, Tony Curtis in drag kissing Marilyn Monroe is just like you know mind bending on so many different levels. You know, I mean, we know it's a guy kissing a girl, but you know, immediately, you know, what's Sweet Sue's reaction is beanstalk because what's what's going on up there? Uh, there's all sorts of uh, you know button pushing going on. Uh, I, I lost the thought, I'll, and I'll, if, I, if, I, if I come back to it, I, I will I refer to it. But yes, yeah, so you're, but you're right. They're they're doing all sorts of things uh, with, uh, with 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 gender roles, with uh, sexual power relationships, and they're, they're deliberately. I mean, that's what the I, that's the real subtext of the film is is what's going on there. I mean, look at how 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 Jerry, excuse me, Joe, Joe, the Tony Curtis character is a womanizer. And when he's dressed up as Josephine, what happens? That obnoxious bellboy keeps hitting on him. You know, and now he's seeing how the other half lives. You know, and by the same token, and this is very, I, I think it's something that actually makes the film resonate today, is when, when Jack Lemmon goes, I can't believe this guy pinched me in the elevator. You know, I'm, you know look at me. He goes, oh, it's like they'll pinch anything wearing a dress. You know, it's like, it's like waving a flag in front of a bull. And you know, what, with all this talk about sexual harassment today, that you know, it's like these two guys are dis discovering how the other half really lives. Well, is this like my old classes? I just stunned them into silence. No, we are good. We have another question. I just want to say how much I enjoyed. I'll have what she's having, and if if any of you are movie buffs, you will love this book. It's just fun, it's factual, it's just thoroughly enjoyable. And I thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 